in Lyon, for those who I haven't met uh, yet the last uh, three days. Um, um, I'm going to chair the session, and the session, and I'm realizing that I'm the first speaker of this session, and I'll be also the last speaker of this session, <laughs> and going to make the connection to the round table that will be presided by, uh, by Christian. Um, I'd like to do something a little bit different. So I changed a little bit, let's say, the focus of my presentation and talk a little bit about access to vulnerable populations and access to different networks in developing countries, which definitely relates also to the, uh, the focus of the work of the Mario Foundation. So to come back to uh, this focus of the foundation, um, which is really targeting developing countries, so fighting infectious diseases uh, in developing countries and vulnerable populations. And as we know, vulnerable populations are not always restricted to developing countries and lowest income developing countries. And we have vulnerable populations now also in high income and middle income countries. Um, the, the one of the objectives, apart from having this beautiful knowledge center, uh, global health center, Pensier, here in Annecy, uh, there is two main programmatic uh, objectives of the foundation. And one is to strengthen the laboratory capacity and quality of clinical laboratory platforms in developing countries integrated in national healthcare systems. Uh, and the second objective is to enhance local research competencies and capabilities by training young scientists and young researchers to develop and by developing collaborative research and training programs. So these have been the focus of the foundation, which is really, we are not a distributing, a money distributing foundation. We are an operational foundation and being operational in developing countries involved in uh, infectious diseases. So talking about these vulnerable populations and coming back to the subject of refugees, or how it's mentioned always in literature, the displaced persons. These are the numbers of displaced persons in, in the world. And what you can see on this graph is that up until 1911, the, uh, uh, the rate has been more or less stable. But then starting from 1911, it, it rises steeply from around 40 million people to nowadays 70 million people, and, and they're on the rise. So estimates are that we will reach 100 very soon up to 200 and even more if we add on top of that the what we call the climate refugees. So people who are driven by, by food and resources and water resources and other climate change uh, development. So currently uh, the estimate is that we have around 70 million um, refugees, forcibly displaced person. Um, 40 million of those are internally displaced. So they, in literature, one makes the difference between internally displaced and those who cross the borders and go to another country. So the internally displaced are around 40 million and 28 million are crossing borders and moving to other countries. So 70 million is approximately equivalent to the entire population of this beautiful country. Um, two thirds of those refugees come from this just five countries, from Syria, from South Sudan, from Somalia, Afghanistan, and recently also from Myanmar, formerly Burma. Um, the Syrian refugees now constitute the largest refugee crisis in the world. There are 12 million internally displaced Syrians and there are 5 million refugees that have crossed the border to different neighboring countries. And then the Rohingya refugees in Bangladesh crisis is the fastest growing refugee crisis in the world. And although the speed has been reduced a little bit nowadays, we are still on a one refugee every two seconds, which if you translate that in another way, by the end of my talk of 25 minutes, there will be 750 uh, Burmese that will have landed on the shores of Bangladesh. This picture shows you the, um, what we call the Rodolphe Mirieu Laboratories. So the research and um, um, training platforms that the foundation has built, uh, literally built in various countries starting from 2005. Um, and as you can see, um, if I come back to the Syrians and the, the Myanmar issues, we have a laboratory platform in Bangladesh 
in the same province where those refugees have landed. And in Syria, uh, in Lebanon, we have a laboratory which is 20 kilometers from the heart of the refugee camps. So the, um, we are very well organized, basically, to study and to work and to perform operational activities uh, with these populations. The laboratories that we install in different countries are not foundations laboratories. So we actually give them to the countries. We have a sort of governance structure where the university, the local university is involved in the Ministry of Health and the foundation. So we do not control, it's not ours, we support them in, 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 in their activities, which is in particular training, routine microbiology and research. So this is a picture of uh, during my first visit uh, to Lebanon uh, in the Beka Valley of what the United Nations call informal tented camps. So what is an informal tented camps? It's exactly the same as the formal tented camps. The only difference is that there is no electricity and no access to clean drinking water. So the situation is even worse, but they look absolutely similar. Uh, most of the refugees in, uh, in Lebanon uh, are not living under these conditions anymore. One third is still there and two thirds have been absorbed and are moving into the country and they live under bridges or in, in, in houses, unfinished buildings uh, in Beirut, around Beirut and different areas. So very difficult to trap and very difficult to catch. This is the local uh, uh, Middle East situation. So we are talking of five million refugees in the area, Syrian refugees. Um, almost four million ended up in Turkey. Um, the official figures are that there's one million refugees in Lebanon. The total population of Lebanon is four point, before the refugee crisis is 4.5 million. But the actual figures are probably much higher and probably more around 1.5 million refugees because they just stopped to count them. And then um, a smaller percentage is going into Jordan, uh, 700,000 refugees over there. So most of them ended up in Turkey and um, I'm sure you have seen those pictures of let's say almost military camps organized by the Turks with clean access, access to clean drinking water, very well organized and electricity. And what they added on top of that in 2014, uh, all the refugees in the country, four million, were granted secure legal status and access to the national healthcare system uh, covered uh, under the general healthcare insuring system and paid by the government. So all received education, all received or have access to education, all receive uh, health care wherever they are. Uh, most of the Turkish refugees are not anymore in the camps. They were absorbed in the country. And I recently visited uh, Istanbul and there are one million Syrian refugees in Istanbul. They have jobs, they work, they are insured, they receive education when they're young. Uh, of course, they, they don't speak the language, but they share the same religion and they are easily absorbed within the, the local communities. There are exceptions, of course, but the overall view is, is, is what I observed. Um, the estimates of numbers so of refugees in Lebanon is 1.5 million, but there are also 1 million of Lebanese population that live under precise, well, almost the same conditions. And on top of that, there is still 300,000 Palestinians that also live in closed camps that are closed by the military each and every night for the last 50 years. So that totals up of to uh, around almost 3 million refugees in, in a country that had originally 4 or 4.5 million inhabitants. 50% of those Syrians are women and, and children. Um, almost 50% of the Syrians live on, on $2.5 per day. And at the other side, also the Lebanese living in the same condition, 10% of those um, live also on the 2.5 US dollar per day regimen. So this is to describe to you the, the, the context of what's happening over there and the rising numbers of refugee that we are seeing in the world. To come back to respiratory infections and in particular to the, uh, the lower respiratory tract infections because that's where the, the mortality is. Um, it's um, in developing countries, including the refugees, uh, they cause nearly 4 million deaths per year. 
so 60 deaths per 100,000 population. And in developing countries among the under fives, up to 25% of deaths are related to, uh, to pneumonia. And the latest uh, UNHCR figures show that the lower respiratory tract infections are the main cause of morbidity and mortality uh, among refugees wherever they are in the world. And there are small communications in literature, and I mentioned here one from Kenya, uh, showing that in the under five, uh, respiratory infections are responsible for 30 to 40 percent of the death and 45 percent of morbidity. Um, and RSV is, of course, high on the list, in particular in this age group, which is not coming as a surprise. So what are the main risk factors for adverse events in, in lower respiratory tract infections? Of course, it's malnutrition. And many of the populations that we're talking of are malnourished. There is usually a very low vaccination status. If you take the example of the uh, Rohingya refugees, for the last 20 years, they haven't received any educational support from governments, and most of them have not received any vaccination. They live under poor shelter condition, of course, and sometimes extreme weather conditions. The weather in the Beka Valley at night during winter is, is minus 10. Um, they live under very crowded situations, not everywhere, uh, a bit less in, in Lebanon, for example, a bit more among the Rohingyas, and I'll show you a few pictures uh, later on. And in many places, still poor access to, to quality uh, health care. These are figures from, uh, from MSF um, showing the main morbidities among Syrian refugees in the Bekaa Valley. And in orange is the, uh, the proportion of, uh, of respiratory tract infections. So it's almost 50% of the primary health care visits are related to either upper or lower respiratory tract infections. And in, in number two is, is in blue uh, beneath uh, the, um, the, the watery diarrhea watery and bloody diarrhea, but predominantly water diarrhea. So there's a high morbidity and mortality uh, due to respiratory tract infections among uh, Syrian refugees, uh, in part also due to a low access to uh, laboratory diagnostics, almost none. The people working there in the primary health care settings work without any diagnostic uh, support from the laboratory. So what we set up to do over there is to uh, set up a, a pneumonia etiology study because the etiology of the severe infections related to mortality were unknown. And we designed a case control study with um, a sample size of 1,200, 600 cases and 600 controls among the Syrian um, refugees, uh, but also the Lebanese population living around and with them. Uh, we started the study in 2016 and we uh, finished the inclusions uh, a couple of months ago. So this is Lebanon. Um, um, and as you know, there are in, in red are the main concentration of refugees, which come from the east, from Syria. I marked uh, Damascus on the slide, which is just a two or three hour drive to, to Beirut, but over the mountains. Um, they enter from the east uh, into the Beka Valley and into Baalbek. And then there's another um, um, move and flow of refugees coming from the north, more from the regions of Latakia, uh, going into Tripoli area. So we uh, choose and selected uh, three study sites to include the patients, one in the north and one in the Baalbek regions and one in, uh, in the Bekaa Valley. And we identified partners, local partners, local NGOs, Al-Bashir for the Tripoli region and for the Bekaa, we uh, reliant on the AMEL, which is one of the largest local and operational NGOs in the country. So the picture shows you the, uh, the, those who represent the different organizations uh, uh, related to, uh, to the study. And we had, of course, advisors from different places, different places in the world. So our primary objective was to estimate the proportion of the community-acquired pneumonia attributable to specific viruses and specific bacteria. And the second objective was to assess the, uh, the feasibility and the performance of a rapid film array point of care diagnostic test in a setting of humanitarian crisis. Um, the inclusions were, we, we, we excluded patients from zero to two. Um, we excluded, we included only acute 
respiratory illnesses, so we excluded many of the TB, uh, probably um, cough or dyspnea and uh, lower chest wall in drawings or a breath rate greater than 40 uh, breaths per minute in absence of wheezing. This is a, a, a picture of a waiting room, a typical area. This is in Tripoli, uh, so in the north. Uh, and I would just like to ask you how many guys you're seeing on this picture. Um, there are more than 50 people in the picture and I count only two men and all the others are women and children. Very, very typical uh, for the situations in the other sites and also for the situation in the Rohingya camps. It's mainly mothers and children that come up. Um, a few results. Uh, so we calculated the attributable fraction, so the fraction of pneumonia that can be attributed to specific, a specific viral or bacterial pathogen. And, and, and we came up, of course, with, uh, let's say, a top four, which includes influenza, uh, strep pneumo, RSV, parainfluenza, et cetera, et cetera. Um, there's a wide range, as you can see, when we talk of strep pneumo, which is not completely explained, but we run the study over two winter seasons and the two were very, very different. The first one was very, very cold with a high incidence of strep pneumo and the second one was, was very, very warm and we, uh, there was a very low incidence of strep pneumo related infections. Another way of presenting the data is, is this graph where we separated the, the children under five, the children above five and the adults. And as you can see, the, the RSV, for example, comes up as number one in the under five, not surprisingly, uh, but influenza is the one that dominates in the, in the elderly and in the children above five. Um, surprisingly, maybe a coronavirus is in the, it among the top three in adults, which is not very high on the list in, in children. Um, in literature, one can find more or less similar data from other refugee camps. This is data coming from Kenya where influenza, um, metanumo, RSV, and, and parainfluenza pops up as, as important pathogens related to uh, severe respiratory infections. And th these are other data coming from the Thai-Myanmar border, so the other side, not the Bangladesh side, but the Thai side of, of Myanmar, where it's the usual suspects, I think, RSV and influenza and metanumo that pop up as important uh, pathogens. This was a study looking only into viral pathogens, not into bacterial pathogens. Um, we are extending the study, looking also into the, uh, uh, doing some uh, transcriptomics and looking into uh, RNA profiles of human leukocytes. Uh, we haven't results of the, the particular work, but the idea is to better attribute and differentiate between carriership and those organisms that are really associated with uh, pathology. So what you can see on this slide um, but this is not our data. Uh, these are the, the profiles that you see in, in controls, and here's the profiles that one sees in bacterial uh, pneumonia. So we hope that we'll be able to differentiate using these type of technologies between carriership and, and better attribute a particular pathogen to a particular pathology. So now going back um, and, and forward to the situation in, in Bangladesh. This is a picture of my, one of my visits to the area, and uh, which, uh, for those who are not familiar, are, 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 are quite tough pictures. Uh, there is one million refugees over there, over now. Uh, there is probably around 200,000 um, um, Rohingya still left in Myanmar, but most of them have crossed the border and are living under these type of conditions in a very tiny, tiny piece uh, of land in a hilly area which used to be uh, full of trees, but they're not there anymore, um, under, under very difficult, uh, difficult conditions. Uh, there are latrines here and there. There's one latrine for 100 uh, Rohingyas in the camps. Uh, just to give you an indication and, and on, on, on the, the context and the difficulties that they are uh, encountering. Um, here's a refugee building a, uh, either a latrine or a, a deep well. Um, this is a picture that one just walking through the camps that one can see. On one side you see a, a latrine where we dump um, what the, 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 the fecal uh, materials 
and just three meters away from that is a deep well. So there's not clear distance between the latrines and, and the deep well in the country. So there's, there's many, many examples in, in that area. We're trying to do our best, but we're not doing always the things in the right way. And then very recently, the Bangladesh government had the outrageous idea of sending back uh, the refugees to Burma um, on a voluntary basis, um, um, as they promised to the UN. And when they tried to uh, identify those who volunteered to go back, of course, no one wanted. And, and it was almost a revolution that was started within the camps, because no one wants to go back to a place where they all were either murdered or raped and, and their villages burned. Um, talking about infections, um, what one usually sees in, is related to water or foodborne or vector-borne diseases in these emergency settings. So we talk a lot about cholera and acute watery diarrhea. Uh, we talk about typhoid fever. There is, there is hepatitis A. There is hepatitis E, though not identified in, in the Rohingya camps, but there is a huge outbreak of several thousand patients uh, in, uh, nearby in Chittagong uh, of hepatitis E. Measles, of course, is a big one, of course. Um, vector-borne disease, malaria, dengue, chikungunya, uh, uh, high in the city in that particular area, and then acute respiratory infections, the main cause of death uh, in the under five among refugees. There was a diphtheria outbreak, as you know, uh, that started at the end of uh, 2017 with in total 8,000 suspected and probable cases. Um, of those, 277 were, were confirmed by PCR and led to uh, 44 deaths. The epidemic is almost over. There were several rounds of vaccinations against diphtheria among the refugees, uh, alongside vaccination programs uh, for, for measles and, and, and cholera. We started a similar study over there, uh, sort of almost copy-paste from the study among the refugees in Lebanon um, to study the uh, um, etiology of pneumonia. Uh, among the same uh, populations and uh, identifying our partners over there, the foundation laboratory uh, that we have in Chittagong and government sites, primary healthcare clinics uh, in, the, in the camps. Uh, the study just started this summer and is, is uh, going on. We added another uh, sort of sub-study here where we're going to look at the impact of rapid diagnostics uh, in the camps. Impact measure as uh, severity uh, following up the severity of the patients, the antibiotic use of the patients, and of course, at the end, also mortality. So to end uh, with a few slides, um, there are many needs in these crisis situations. And I think managing, better managing and addressing the health risks is, is important to reduce the vulnerability of the populations over there. Better characterizing epidemiology and etiology of acute respiratory infections is important to to rationalize the, the disease priorities. We need to improve the diagnostics, and in particular the access to diagnostics in the particular regions and to optimize treatment algorithms. Make better use of new vaccines against haemophilus, pneumococcus, measles, pertussis, um, and of course measure the effectiveness of all our interventions. I'd like to end with uh, this slide, and I'll, I'll come back basically to where we started uh, two days ago and the presentation of Christian where he showed the, the network of the foundation and the different laboratory platforms that the foundation has. Um, we discussed now recently the issues in, uh, in, in Bangladesh, the refugees and the platform we have nearby in Lebanon, but uh, just see where we are in Madagascar where we had the Yersinia outbreak in Haiti, uh, the hurricane and the cholera outbreak. Uh, it seems that the foundation has a presence in every place where a disaster is taking place, which makes the choice of the next platform that we are going to build very, very difficult, because it seems like not long after we build a laboratory, there is an outbreak. <laughs> but that, take it as an opportunity. And what I wanted to do is, is open this network, basically, for, for collaboration, whatever collaboration. We are there. These are small structures. We are wor working together with usually local uh, uh, operational institutions. And uh, I think it's by working together 
uh, it's the only way to solve the issues I've raised and the issues to come. Um, I'll leave it here and I'm ready to take any questions. Um,